so much for coming today. I am super excited to have Katie Holloway, who is a Paralympic gold medalist in sitting, sitting volleyball. Katie, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank Can you for you having me. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you fell in love with volleyball, and just your journey? Sure. So. Um, I am an amputee. I'll start with that. I was actually born without a fibula bone in my right leg. Um, and it wasn't until I started walking at 10 months that my parents noticed my foot was turned out to the side, brought me into a specialist and found out that I was missing the fibula bone and I was born with a condition called fibular hemimelia. Um, and so at that point, they had two decisions that one, they could amputate my foot um, from basically the, the ankle bone down, or they could do a limb lengthening procedure that would involve a, a series of surgeries growing up. I would have to wear a shoe lift. I probably couldn't run or be very active. And so at two years old, they decided to amputate my foot and I was fit with a prosthetic um, and really um, growing up, I was a part of a small community, so there were no kids with disabilities around me. Um, and I really just had, was kind of um, thrust into um, the environment that my family created for me, which often was sports. And so at around four years old, I started playing, um, you know, a little basketball. I started playing t-ball. I played pretty much everything I tried um, at a young age and really felt like when I was playing sports, I was quote unquote normal. And um, <clears throat> it wasn't really until I reached probably the age of uh, middle school that I started to, and a little bit in elementary school too, kids started saying, what's wrong with your leg? <laughs> and I would, I would say, my, you know, my foot was amputated, my foot was, was fit with prosthetic, and then I'd just run off. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and then in, when I reached in middle school, um, I started getting teased more and picked on, and it was actually the girls on my team that created that for me. Um, and really it was hard because I played softball, I played volleyball, I played basketball, and I was just trying to stay on par with the rest of the kids in my school. Um, but I quickly learned how to hate my disability and hate who I was as a person with a disability growing up through middle school and high school. Um, and for me, I started to hide it. I um, would wear tall socks and pretend that nobody knew. Um, and sports was a comfort zone because I could just go out there, run around and, and be successful. Um, and so I thought I could hide it. And um, so in, in high school, I made it a goal to um, play basketball at the division one level. Um, I learned of a guy by the name of Mike Edwards who um, was a Division I basketball player at no uh, Notre Dame who walked on. And um, I thought, well, if he could do it, I could do it, right? And at that time, I was still getting picked on and bullied and kind of, you know, in a way that girls are, are in school these days. And it was really uncomfortable and I hated it and I hated who I was still and I carried all of that with me. And I wanted to prove them wrong. I was like, oh, I'm so mad and I just want to prove them all wrong. And so that really motivated me to um, then uh, make my goal happen, which was to get a Division I scholarship to play um, basketball at Cal State Northridge. Um, and once I got to Northridge, I still carried this hate for my disability. Um, with me and I still wanted to prove people wrong and I was wearing tall socks and I was hiding it still and the media department wanted to talk about it and I said no and um, it wasn't until um, 2006 when the Paralympic team um, for volleyball came and trained at my school at Northridge and they asked if I would come see a practice and so I went out to see a practice. I saw girls playing a sport of volleyball uh, with disabilities, and they were athletes. They were athletes with disabilities. And I was like, hey, that's, that's kind of who I am. And um, my whole life changed after that. I um, ended up going to a training camp in Atlanta, Georgia for the, for the first time for Paralympic volleyball. My coaches both agreed that it would be good for me, both basketball and volleyball. And the rest is kind of history. I made a complete 180 um, in my life. I, I remained an athlete with a disability, and I think this is important. Nothing really changed in terms of my life except for how I viewed myself 
and that was huge. I became, I love, I started to love myself. I started to learn about other girls with disabilities and athletes with disabilities and learned that they could love themselves for who they were with all of what they provided to the world and um, in their bodies of how they were. And um, I started to absorb that. And from there, um, my life became so much happier. I was um, very negative growing up and I feel like I became so much happier and um, embraced who I was as an athlete with a disability. So yeah, so basically uh, I graduated from Cal State Northridge in 2008, um, went to the Beijing Paralympics immediately um, and we won silver there. And then we went to London and won silver there and gold in Rio. So, um, and then I'm still on the team. I've been on the team for 14 years and now I'm the, uh, the captain of the team and I'll stop there. That was a lot. So that was, that's kind of like an overview of, of really growing up and my life and coming to where I am today. And you were the first woman to play D1 basketball with a prosthetic limb. So what was that like? Um, it was hard. <laughs> um, playing Division One basketball was like a constant battle of proving to myself that I could do it and proving to others that always said I couldn't do it. Um, and um, Division One basketball is incredibly difficult mentally um, and physically. It, it physically pushes you to the level where you mentally want to break down and quit every day. Um, and um, at the same time, my experience, I think, was good because my coaching staff um, did everything in their power to treat me like all the rest of the girls. So I still had to make the running times and um, everybody was still accountable to me making those running times. So um, I, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm glad that I did it. I wouldn't go back and do it again if, I, if somebody made me, mostly because it was so difficult. It was very hard. Um, and what was hard about it was it tests your inner, um, inner self to say, do I really love this? And do I really wanna be doing this every day? And it proved to me that I did but it, it was a lot of heart that it took. And I always say like it, for me, when things got really hard, it was my heart that came out and I was able to use that to lean on, to keep going and to not stop every single day. So <clears throat> I feel like it was extremely difficult and it taught me a lot in my life and it's made me um, more successful today because I can be on a team at work and I'm very successful as a team player. It taught me responsibility and accountability. It's taught me how to be a leader and be a successful leader um, by the amount of responsibility it takes in these positions. So um, I, I learned a lot, but it was very difficult and I cried a lot. <laughs> I cried a lot. Kind of like me during finals week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the Paralympics and how are they different from the Olympics? Yeah, so a lot of people don't know that um, the Paralympics come uh, four to six weeks after the Olympic Games. So Tokyo is next year and um, we will be coming in. They start in July. We start the end of August and the Paralympics actually means parallel to the Olympics. So um, we all are people with disabilities of some way, shape or form. And we just play a different version typically of the sports that you know in the Olympic games. And um, I think that's one difference that people don't quite understand is they think it means like paraplegic or some form of um, that you're paralyzed and um, that we all win. And that's not the case at all. Uh, we all compete for medals and we all just have um, physical disabilities. Um, and they're played in the same host city as the Olympic Games. Um, we just have two different organizations, but um, in the US, we're all under the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, now recently named, which I'm really proud of, our organization for creating that um, inclusion. And what was it like for you to be there with all of these athletes with disabilities? Was that also part of what changed how you see yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I think my first experience in Beijing, it was like, Everything was just so amazing. There was, it was just such a big scale in Beijing. Um, and then being now, going from competing in an able-bodied environment um, to a complete um, environment with people with disabilities in, in sport was uh, very eye-opening. And at the same time, very, um, 
it just made me feel like I was in the right place. And also, I'm so fascinated by the amount of differences of people with disabilities and their abilities to compete in the sports that they do. Um, have you guys ever heard of goalball? Anybody? No? Well, it's a uh, sport for people that are blind and they throw a ball at the end of the court and there's three people and they have to block it and the, the crowd is completely silent. It's very crazy. They're, the ball has a bell in it so that they can hear it. Um, and it's incredible. So there are, there are so many examples of that that make you actually see sport in a different way and see people with disabilities in a different way. And that's what it's done for me. So you won two silvers and then you won a gold. So what changed between those two experiences? Yeah, so um, between silver and gold, there was a lot that happened. And each, we call them quads. So every four years between the games, we call a quad. And so um, in those four years between Beijing and London, I moved and lived at our training site and became a full-time athlete at our training site. And um, I, I actually learned the sport of volleyball all over again. Um, I had played in high school a little bit, but I really learned sitting volleyball between those years. And we really thought going into London, we were gonna win and um, China took us down. <laughs> um, and then between London and Rio, um, you know, it was a totally different um, ball game. We, I had been training now for more than four years at our resident training site, and, um, and then I had moved up here to the Bay Area. So from 2013 to 2016, I was out here at the Rikers Center training, and uh, I learned a lot. Personally, for me, the journey was about how do you train and motivate yourself um, when you're not in an environment that's set up for you, and that's extremely difficult um, to motivate yourself to do the things that you just sometimes just don't want to do. And so from my experience individually, it was extremely hard to set up an environment where I could be successful to train and maintain a level of um, elite on the team. But the Rikus Center has helped me do everything in terms of training and uh, having this court for volleyball and all the things that I need structure-wise, they have helped me. But then with the team, what differences was we made is we really started to kind of um, focus on ourselves and what we needed to do to get better. We, we trained more together. We had more sports performance staff. So we had a dietitian, we got a sports psychologist, and we really started to make the shift of like what we needed to do to beat China, who was our main competitor. And um, if you know anything about it, uh, it's a pretty crazy story about our journey to beating China in about a 10 year span. We lost a lot and then we crushed them in the finals in, in Rio. So Incredible. that was fun. You should YouTube it. It's a fun game to watch. For me it was because we just, we don't normally, we never have beaten them 3-0 and we just, we went out there and just took care of business and it was so much fun. And how has athletics and volleyball changed the way that you look at winning and look at loss? Oh man, um, I think competing in a sport teaches you a ton of life lessons. I think every day I get excited about all the things that I can learn from my teammates and from being a leader on the team now. Um, but winning and losing is hard and Winning, it, it's interesting because I'll, I'll say it like this. When between the quads in Beijing, we lost really bad. China beat us and we were just happy to be in the gold medal match. So that was exciting in and of itself. We came home with silver. We're happy, but we're like, oh man, we, we lost those still. We have so much room to grow. Um, after London, we walked into London certain that we would have a chance to win, but not certain we would win. And when we came back, I would say that was probably one of the most depressing times of my life, coming back from London and not achieving your goal and figuring out what you're gonna do with your life. And as I said earlier, you live your life in quads. So you spend a significant amount of four years planning to win. And when you don't win and you come home and no one cares, <laughs> Largely, no one cares of what you just accomplished, or they say, oh, silver, you know, that's so great still. And you're like, that's not enough, you know? Um, so it teaches you that life has all these transitions. And 
it could be daily you have transitions in your life or from four year windows you have transitions. And it's how you navigate that transition in life from whether you're winning or losing. Because then when I came back from Rio, uh, we won. And I was very excited. And I def definitely didn't go into the depression that I went through after London. But I still went through a transition. And it's a matter of recognizing and being aware that it's a time of transition, a time of uncertainty, and then spending time in your feelings and being able to feel that and being able to notice that that is what you're going through and being okay with that and then moving into it um, when you can and when you're ready and a series of exploration what's next what's that opportunity and i think that um, those natural those wins and losses of sport do that for us but in the real world for you guys and for people wins and losses come every day, right? A, a test score or um, a paper came back and it's not what you wanted, those things. And then coming back and getting back on your feet and starting all over again, or just saying that was a blip or I just fell off and getting back up and, and knowing that you learned from that experience. So I think those are the important things about wins and losses that really apply hopefully to you guys is like, how do you guys um, look at every single thing in your life as a winner. If, if you're looking at it as a winner loss, you know, try, try to look at it as an opportunity to learn from. And what's the role that confidence has played in your success? Uh, interesting question. So I would say a huge part of my story was loving who I was as a person with a disability. And, um, I, and that's sort of related to confidence, I think. Um, so I would say until I was 20 or until I was really a part of this team, I didn't have a whole lot of confidence. And once I started loving myself for who I was and all the things that I brought to the table, I'm tall, I have one leg, I'm, you know, I, I have a podcast. All the things that are different about me make me special and, and it's a good thing. And once I started embracing that, you start to feel more happy about who you are and then that translated into the world. And I feel like once I started actually doing that in my life, so many good things come to you because you're positive. And when you're positive and when you're happy with others around you, people wanna be around you, right? And so that to me is confidence and feeling happy with what you're doing and making a choice every day to do something you like to do is where that confidence comes in. And I would say like one of the things that is an example of that is like, I felt like um, I didn't, I, I really like to, uh, I dated in college a little and I had, um, you know, relationships here and there, but I really never had a boyfriend. And um, when I started to fully love myself, that is when I felt like there were boys that could then like me. But until I showed that I love myself, there wasn't really somebody that could really step into my life and love me. And, um, and so it wasn't until I was like 27 that I had a full relationship for the first time. And now I have somebody that truly loves me and I love him. And it's so wonderful because I love myself first and then he loves the best version of me. And so I think that that's where confidence comes in is, is really feeling good about what you're doing and who, who you are and being really positive about what it is that's a part of your life and, and valuing that. And so that all to me is what confidence means. And can you tell us a little bit about your podcast? Sure. So I um, started a podcast with my friend who's another Paralympian and we're really passionate about showing off the Paralympic athletes um, and their stories and um, really talking about the elite um, Paralympic sport um, and what goes on from day to day. And so it's called Inside Parasport. And we really didn't feel like there was a lot of conversation going on between the games. So we started um, a podcast and we showcase everyone from athletes to, we have a prost uh, prosthetist on there. We've interviewed NBC producers about how they um, view the games. And so we're really just talking um, to people in the movement about Paralympics and what goes on between the games and what they're doing in their lives. And it's so interesting and I love it. And it's, uh, you should check it out if you're interested in Paralympic sports because the amount of 
things that you learn about people with disabilities and their experiences in life in the, from the Paralympic sport lens is very fascinating. It's, it is to me at least. <laughs> and what advice would you give to girls who want to grow up and follow your footsteps? Oh, work really hard. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and I think the, my advice is to focus on what, what you like to do and who you are and who you want to be. Um, because in, at the end of the day, it's not about what other people think about you. I think that's the one thing that was the, probably the saddest thing that I think I see with young girls is we care too much about what other people think about us. And who really matters is yourself, how you think about yourself, and how you, the people you love think about you. And that's your parents, that's your siblings, that's your cousins and your family and your friends. Those are people that you love the most your best friend, right? Who, who you spend the most time with matters how you, how you feel and how you are in the world. And I think that so often girls get into this um, really hard place of trying to, trying to be something for other people. And I mean, trust me, it doesn't go away. <laughs> it's always there. Um, we always are concerned about how others uh, think about us, but I feel like that's how I've been successful is really truly knowing who I am and being happy with that and then not worrying about if somebody is mad or whatnot. I, I think that with good communication, you can address things, but um, as long as you're comfortable with yourself, um, then you'll, you can be happy and successful. So that's, that's kind of my advice. Awesome. Yeah. Girls, do you have any questions? Um, so, so the next, question yeah. was, okay. uh, what's next and what are your objectives for the future? Yeah, thank you. Um, so next year is Tokyo Paralympics. Uh, we have quite the travel schedule, so I know it's going to be chaotic. I actually work um, almost full time as well. So balancing out our travel schedule with work and then um, honing in on the goal of we, we want to win gold next year. That's no question. Um, we are set up to do that. We were undefeated this year, which was nice. Um, but what's interesting about my journey is the older I get, the more I notice how important the journey actually is versus the winning. And so the more I can focus on the process and the journey, the, more, the happier I am and the more I'm like fulfilled by the experience. And the more I focus on the winning part, the more I get anxiety, the more I get stressed out when I play. I, I have a hard time serving now because I just, I'm thinking about the outcome and how people think about me and all of those things. And so for me, this next year is really, really focusing on how do I enhance my relationship with my girls on the team? How do I enhance their experience? How do I make sure to lead in a way that I would want to be led? And how do I use this experience to be very fulfilled in my life versus winning gold, which is kind of the opposite of what you would think. Um, don't get me wrong, we wanna win. <laughs> But I know that if I can put all my love into these girls and into my team, into my coaching staff and into this experience, that I'm doing the best I can do and that everybody else will bring their best. And um, that's hard to do, actually. Um, it's a lot harder than you think <laughs> um, because it's challenging environment. There's 12 girls on the team plus other, you know, there's 14 or 15 of us that are really dedicating our lives to this with the coaching staff. And so, um, just making the experience the best possible um, and spending really every minute just loving on other people is what I love to do. And so that fulfills me. And I think naturally that will, then the gold will take care of itself. Do you want to repeat the question? Yeah, so you asked <laughs> about your prosthetic leg. Yeah, so um, it is not my whole leg. So this is, I call this my pretty leg um, because I can wear heels with it. I have like a little button here and I can push down the foot and it can wear heels. Not that I need it because I'm 6'3". But, um, so it's not my whole <laughs> leg, but I have um, all the way down to basically where my ankle would be. And then um, I'm like a Symes amputation. So I have my whole leg all the way except for my foot. 
um, which is actually really helpful for walking and playing in sport because I have more of a leg to, to use. So this is my pretty leg. Um, so, good question. I actually train with people locally here. So, I met a guy on a plane a couple weeks ago and was like, hey, come play sitting volleyball. And he came and trained with me. So, um, I actually play with local volleyball players more than I play with the Olympic athletes. So, the Olympic athletes are down in Southern California and we train out in Oklahoma. So, we don't often train together. I can't hear you. I think it's about like how does the prosthetic leg help you move? Or? Yeah, so I, um, I don't walk hardly any different than I think you do. Um, and how I equate it is it's like a shoe. So you wear your everyday shoes. I wear my everyday leg. I have to put it on to get um, up and out of bed and walk around just like you do. And then um, I have a running leg, which helps me run. So I put on a different running shoe, right? Or I have an athletic leg that I play basketball with. Um, and I, it's just a, more of a carbon fiber leg. But I, um, I wouldn't say I walk any different. It's just like a shoe that I put on and off. And I take it off in the shower. It can't get wet, those kinds of things. I do not sleep with it. It's again, it's like shoes. Like you're like, oh, at the end of the day, I need it off. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, how did you deal with your bullies? Um, so it was a long time ago. So I don't quite remember all of it. I remember crying a lot, like I said, crying to my mom and my parents a lot. And um, one thing I would say when it was happening, um, in the moment, I just remember being so angry inside and not knowing and confused about how I, I was supposed to act because there's so much pressure on you to react. Um, and I would say what I remember of me in the moment was I would do one of two things. I would, I would close up and I wouldn't say anything because I knew there was no use in like responding because they, they didn't deserve a response from me. Um, the other thing is I would fight back. I would tell them to stop. And I would um, get really mad, and I would tell them to stop, and then I would go tell an adult, usually. And so I think, I don't know if that's the right way. I think it's, um, I think actually being physical is the wrong way. But I think however you need to respond in a positive way or in, a, in the way that you feel is right, is important to do, um, but that's that was my experience. And then when it was a matter of like being cut from teams and having more significant um, things happening from it, like the girls on my team being more bullies and re recognizing that there was an opportunity to go play in a different town over, my mom would say, do you, if you're cut from this team and these girls are making you unhappy, can we just go to another town over and, and put you on another team? And I was like, she's like, do you want to play? And I said, yeah. And she's like, okay, well then let's go somewhere else. And I can't tell you how different that was for me. And, and I had such a great experience with these other girls from this other town over, which felt like awful because you're in the school every day with girls um, and these girls. And being able to be friends and have a positive experience with another group of girls was everything to me. So I feel like the other lesson is, is to not give up on what you want and to find a different way. Use your resources, talk to your parents, talk to your family, talk to your friends about what your resources are to do something different. Would you do it differently now that you have a lot more experience and a lot more confidence? <sighs> Would I do it differently? I think that in the, no, I, I think I would still, I would still probably react the way I did in, in those instances. Um, I tried not to show them that it hurt me by not crying in front of them. And I would say sometimes being vulnerable is important and you'll learn that later in life. That's a big, that's a big word and a big feeling. Um, and vulnerability means more to older people, I think. <laughs> Younger girls don't understand that part. So um, I, I don't think I would do anything different. 
Yeah, last question. Well, are there other people on your team who have um, disability? Disability? Yeah. Um, good question. So I. Maybe if you could just touch on like the broad type of range of disabilities sure. that people play. Sure. So um, I have fibular hemimelia, and actually about maybe three other girls on my team have the same thing, which is pretty interesting. Um, and one of the girls is actually from the area too. She's from Dublin. So um, that was kind of a cool story of how we found her and brought her into the fold. Um, other girls on my team went through traumatic accidents. So um, one girl got thrown off a boat and her leg, whatever, accidents, <laughs> amputee, all of those things. Um, so we have uh, a girl that's, a few girls that are cancer survivors, um, but most of them are amputees in one shape, way, shape, or form. Um, and typically our sport of sitting volleyball is primarily um, amputees. And so whether you're a double leg amputee or a single leg amputee, um, we have a, a lot of different cases for different girls. One girl, um, got an accident with a forklift and so they had to amputate her foot uh we have all kinds of stories and they're very crazy yeah so but we're mostly amputees i would say some of the men's team um, were uh, veterans in iraq and afghanistan and so they were they became amputees from um, accidents over there awesome yeah well thank you for being so vulnerable yeah. with us and sharing your story of so course openly. of course thank you and i have my medals Oh, medals. Sorry, I wanted to share with you guys. You can pass them around. Um, these are my medals from the Paralympics. Um, so this is the one from Beijing. It has Beijing Jade. Um, this is from London. So these are our two silvers. You can pass them around. And then this one is our gold from Rio. It's got a little chime in there. So... Just wanted to share those as well. Super cool. And you need to like, get set up. Your, okay. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you guys. So we will. Um